Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Uh, this series is sponsored by the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. The director is Sherrod Malik, who's sitting here on the front row. And um, the, the purpose of the Keller Center is to uh, educate leaders uh, for life in the technological world. And this extends to uh, engineers, of course, uh, being an engineering school, but also uh, non-engineers as well. So a lot of students at Princeton uh, take courses in the engineering school uh, under the aegis of the Keller Center. But one of the, th uh, one of the things, uh, most important things that the Keller Center does is to expose students and others in the community to leaders who uh, shown, uh, taken major steps in leadership in the technological world. Uh, and this is definitely the case of our speaker today. So Dave Hitz um, is a prime example of the kind of leader that uh, we'd like for our students to, to hear from. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and a co-founder of NetApp, which uh, 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 is today a $3 billion storage and data management company. I just learned a minute ago that they have offices in 130 countries uh, and 8,000 employees. So it's a very extensive country, uh, company. And uh, as the title of this talk suggests, How to Engineer Your Way from the Lab to the Boardroom, uh, we should all look forward to uh, listening to him describe uh, his experiences beginning uh, from the very beginning of the startup all the way up to what's a very, very successful company today. Dave, Dave graduated from Princeton in 1986 with a BSc in computer science, and I just heard him, he just told me that uh, one of his roommates was Jeff Bezos, who's uh, another class of 1986 and uh, founder of, uh, of Amazon.com. So that, I wonder what was in the walls of that room. I'd really like to know. Uh, anyway, we found a mummified mouse oh. in, a, in a couch that we scavenged from the highway one day. Okay and we hung it by a string over the door. So okay. I think it might have been the mummified so, mouse. To those young entrepreneurs in the audience, this is what you need, a mummified mouse. Uh, anyway, but, but after graduating, uh, after the mummified mouse uh, incident, he went on to, found, uh, to be involved in several startups and then founded NetApp in 1992 with James Lau and Michael Malcolm. So he served in every capacity as uh, keeping with a uh, startup, programmer, marketing evangelist, it says, technical architect, uh, VP of engineering, uh, and now he focuses on future strategy and setting the directions of the company. Uh, I also learned today that Dave is an author, uh, and he has a forthcoming book with a very uh, intriguing title of How to Castrate a Bull. So hopefully you're going to include something in your talk I'll, about I'll that as well. That. Anyway, so please, please join me in welcome. I don't have any slides today, but it is still high tech because in support of Jeff Bezos, I brought my notes on an Amazon Kindle. And I have never done that for a speech before, so we'll find out how it works. Um, I graduated from Princeton in 1986, and I spent the next 13 years as a programmer programmer, system architect, but, but always technical. During that period, nobody ever reported to me. Or with one exception, for three months, two guys reported to me. And I remember my big management challenge during that period was I heard a shouting match between one of the two engineers who reported to me, Guy was his name, and a woman in finance. And the shouting match was about how she had returned to him an expense report that he did with lots of things circled in red. And Guy didn't like getting an expense report with stuff circled in red. So he was shouting at her about how it was really stupid that, the IR, that uh, you are required on the expense report to fill in your telephone bill separately from your food, separately from your hotel bill when you travel. And that was his shouting explanation, and her shouting explanation was that the IRS required that, and his shouting explanation was that that was stupid, and her shouting explanation was that that might be right, but she unfortunately did not control the IRS. Um, and so they separated, and as a manager, my job was to take the crumpled up piece of paper with a pencil poked through it that was the expense report and say, next time, 
instead of returning it to Guy with red ink all over it, maybe you could just bring it to me and we'll talk about it. So after three months, I concluded and the two guys who reported to me concluded that it would be best for me not to be in management anymore. <laughs> so that's the backdrop, 13 years of that. And then 13 years, uh, 1999, after not managing anybody, with that exception, my boss, who was the CEO of, of NetApp, came to me and said, would you like to be the vice president of engineering? Which was 250 people at that point. My reaction was I thought he was crazy. I'd never managed anybody, and the one short experience I had ended in crisis. And I thought, when I was thinking about this talk and this group of people and what you might be interested in, I thought it would be an interesting outline for a talk to understand what was going on in Dan's head. Dan was the CEO. Why he thought it made any sense at all to take me, never managing anybody, and put me in charge of 250 other people because that will help you understand a bunch of stuff. It'll help you understand how CEOs think, what startup dynamics are, um, hopefully a little bit about technology, culture, management. So in fact, let me give you his explanation to me as to why this made sense. His explanation was, if I look at what I need to find in a VP of engineering, here are the things I'd like. I'd like somebody who understands NetApp's technology. And I should say that putting me in charge of engineering wasn't as completely crazy as it sounded, because it was a company that I'd helped start. Um, and so I had been involved with the executive staff and, and the management, although I hadn't actually been anybody's manager. Uh, but, but he said, there's four criteria I have. Number one, I'd like someone who understands the technology. And you do, because you, you helped develop a lot of it. Number two, I'd like someone who understands our market and the, the products that we developed, I'll talk just briefly about what market we were serving, but, but it was a market that we had really helped invent. And so it wasn't something that would be easy to find elsewhere, but, but I'd been working in that space for quite a while. Number three, he said, I'd like someone who understands our culture. And Dan believed that the culture of a, of a company is extremely important. Um, he really focused on how should be, people behave and what are the values. And number four, he says, I'd like someone who can manage which you don't know how to do. But his assessment was you've got three out of four. Whoever else I hire probably will be missing one of the others. And perhaps you can learn how to manage. Perhaps you can't. If you can't, I may have to fire you. But that's a risk he said I'm willing to take. Which, I mean, that's easy for him to say. <laughs> so that was the backdrop. And, and let me use those four areas as the, the focal points for this talk. And then I, I want to leave plenty of room for, for Q&A because I've been told that you guys will just dig in on me. Um, but the, so the four areas are technology, market, marketing, understanding that aspect of things, culture, and then management. From a technology perspective, NetApp sells mostly to large corporations. So most individuals that I talk to don't know NetApp. Most people are indirect customers of NetApp. If you watch the movie Lord of the Rings or Spider-Man, you're an indirect customer of NetApp. We, we sell to a lot of the animation special effects guys. If you use Yahoo email, all of Yahoo's email is stored on NetApp. If you've ever flown on Southwest Airline, all of their ticketing and all of their passenger manifests and, and all of that stuff is stored on NetApp. And if you happen to dodge all of those, we've still got you because the IRS is a big customer. <laughs> so what do we do? Our business is we sell enormous boxes of disk drives to big corporations. But here's the trick. We don't make the disk drives, and mostly we don't make the boxes. What we make is the software that helps customers deal with all of the problems they have on account of all the disk drives we sold them. Right, so what are those problems? Disk drives are completely flaky. They, they fail all the time, so how do you make sure your data is replicated and one drive can fail and two drives can fail? Buildings are flaky. They burn down all the time. So how do we make sure that there's a remote copy of your data in another location? Like, that's the simple stuff. Thieves are coming in and stealing your backup tapes, so how do we make sure they're encrypted? And the SEC is coming in and saying, what did your CEO know and when did he know it? Produce all of the emails he sent five years ago, and you'd better have them. And can you prove no one tampered with them in that time? So these are the kinds of, of things that we help people with. OK, time for some notes. I know there was something else in this section. Um, we, when we started, one of our big focuses was simplicity. We were selling storage systems 
Uh, most of the storage systems attached to the network at the time we started were general purpose computers, Sun computers or Windows systems attached to the Ethernet, uh, producing sharing files. And we thought that just like Cisco did for the router, they built a box that was special purpose designed for TCP IP routing. We felt that doing that same focused appliance for storage would make a lot of sense. And it worked great when we were selling to small engineering work groups. As we started work moving up market, we got pushback on this concept of an appliance. And one of the things that, that our customers asked us is in a, in a heavy duty corporate data center, big IT, does the idea of appliance really make sense? People talked about, you know, an appliance, isn't, doesn't that kind of mean household? Doesn't it kind of mean low end? And, and what, what do you mean by simplicity in such a complicated world? I like to think by analogy, and I, I was staying in a hotel, and I noticed a Mr. Coffee, which is like the ultimate appliance, right? I mean, it's got one button for make coffee, and you pour the water in. Nothing could be simpler. And I started thinking about what would that appliance mean if you thought of it in an enterprise context? So I thought, if I was Mr. Hilton, what would my big problems be, aside from, you know, my granddaughter? And I've, I've, so I've got hundreds of hotels, and each hotel has hundreds of rooms, and there's a Mr. Coffee in every room, and the Mr. Coffees are probably always breaking down. And so even though it's an appliance and it's simple, wouldn't it actually, for me as a big hotel owner, wouldn't it actually be simpler if this appliance would like self-diagnose that it was broken and somehow send me a message that I could say, oh, yes, that, and wouldn't it be simpler I'm a, I'm a hotel owner, I'm Mr. Hilton, I don't want to be repairing coffee machines. Wouldn't it be even simpler still if the Mr. Coffee company would actually sell me a coffee repair service where they listened to the Ethernet broadcast that, hey, I'm a broken Mr. Coffee and come replace it. What's my point here? My point is when you start thinking about simplicity in a technology world, you really have to think carefully to figure out what simplicity is. I mean, I just started adding Ethernet connections and self-diagnosis and coffee repair services to this machine. Clearly, I made my Mr. Coffee a lot more complicated, and yet I would argue to the customer, Mr. Hilton, I made it a lot simpler because he no longer has to worry about fixing broken coffee machines. And it's that line where you start to get to the boundary between good engineering, which is all about cool technology, and marketing, which is really about what what solves customer problems? Tom Mendoza is our vice chairman at NetApp, and for a long time he ran worldwide sales. And when he was giving me lessons about how as an, engineering, as an engineer I wasn't understanding the big picture, one of the things that he explained was, customers do not open their wallets unless they are in pain. His lesson was, you know, engineers get all excited about this is cool technology, and that's great. I mean, it may be groundbreaking physics, it may be a new algorithm, may, there's all sorts of things that from an engineering perspective really are cool, but the question from a business perspective is, does it solve a, a problem that bothers a customer so much that the customer is willing to pay money to solve it? That's a very different question, and it leads to there's a whole bunch of tension that you get between engineers and marketing people. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Do you focus on the technology or do you focus on the customer? To help get my head around this, I started asking customers, what bad thing happens if you lose your data? You really start to understand things more from a customer perspective. I asked the CIO of Southwest Airlines this, and the number one bad thing that happens if they can't access their data is they can't sell tickets. Now, I've noticed in talking with big customers, the application that allows them to collect money from customers is often very high priority for them. Who, who would have thought? <laughs> so here's another fact about Southwest Airlines. Because of the post-911 rules, you, you need to have the passenger list, you need to have the, the cargo manifest. If our storage systems aren't working, it's illegal for a Southwest airplane to take off. And here's one more interesting fact. If our storage systems go down and stay down for two hours, every Southwest plane in the sky must land immediately at whatever airport happens to be closest. <sighs> What's my point? 
it, it, that puts a whole different perspective on thinking about what a cool feature might be. Uh, when, when you talk to customers, it's so tempting, and I've done this myself a lot. Before we started selling to larger customers, I would go out and explain, here's how the waffle file system lays out data on disk in order to optimize multiple spindles, and RAID DP allows any two disks to fail, even though most RAIDs only allow any one disk to fail, blah, 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 blah. I, I was giving this presentation to the CIO of Georgia Pacific, and he explained to me, he had this southern accent, I can't even do it, but he said, son, what you got to understand is, here at Georgia Pacific, we take sawdust, we turn it into toilet paper. <laughs> and what you got to explain to me is, how does your box help me do that better? <laughs> When you think engineering is what matters to the customer, <laughs> you know, that puts a whole different perspective on it. And that may be the most important lesson. And, and I don't mean to downplay engineering at all. I'm an engineer, and that stuff's critically important. My only point is when I talk to people doing a startup, and especially if you're just selling to technical people, that's one thing. But it's talking to people planning to do a broad startup, and it's 10 engineers and one CEO slash marketing guy slash finance guy slash HR guy. I'm like, I'm not sure you're thinking clearly about this problem. I talked, the other question is, what do your customers expect you to do for them? I, I talked to another customer. He was a, an IT director at an insurance company in the Midwest. And I was at one end of the table and the salesman for the account. And then his whole staff, and he's at the other end of the table. And he and I did the same thing I did to the George Pacific guy because I hadn't learned my lesson yet. And he looked at me and he said, here's what you have to understand. My strategy is not to hire smart IT people. Now his staff is lined up on both sides of the table. And they're smiling and nodding. Now I come from Princeton, right? I, I thought smart was a compliment. And so I sort of thought he was insulting his staff. But that's not what he meant. What he meant was, I hire people who are good at judging technology companies, not good at installing the stuff. That's your job. I think the one he said he didn't hire smart people, what he meant was something more like troublesome propeller heads who I'd rather rent than buy. Right? That was, so from a, what did he expect of us as a company? It's not that he didn't think that stuff was important. It's just that he wanted us to hire the troublesome propeller heads. And he wanted us to come in and tell him what his problems were and could we fix it or couldn't we fix it and, and what, what did we, how did all of that stuff. And he had people who would manage us, right? I mean, that, that, was, his mental, that was his mental model. Very different, very different concept. Um, I think my favorite story about understanding the difference between engineers and other people, I was, I was talking to a woman who had run a conference for a bunch of engineers at NetApp, and she was really unhappy because afterwards she asked them for feedback. And the feedback she got, so she ran this big conference, lots of engineering topics, software development, all that stuff, and the feedback she got was, you know, the lunch line would have moved much quicker if you had run it down both sides of the table. Because that one side of the table was just completely wasted and it was kind of a long line. She was crushed. One, she's like, the only feedback I get is completely negative. And two, did they even notice any of the rest of the conference? And my explanation to her was, engineers are people who spot problems and try to fix them. That's what we do, right? And so they spotted a problem and they tried to fix it. The lunch line was too slow. But here's how you should interpret that feedback. If that's the worst problem they found in your conference, you did damn good. But it, Here's another way of looking at it. The optimist says the glass is half full. The pessimist says the glass is half empty. The engineer says, that glass is twice as large as it needs to be to hold the fluid it contains. <laughs> right? It, company values. Um, we were about three years old when our first CEO left and we got a new CEO. Our first CEO had an interesting, uh, an interesting rule of thumb for Silicon Valley CEOs. His observation was the startup CEO of a Silicon Valley company is the shortest shelf life profession you can have. He had two rules. Rule number one, he said, you should never keep more stuff in your office than you can fit in a gym bag. And rule number two was in your office, you should always keep a gym bag. 
So great guy for three years, then, then he left. The new CEO we hired, first thing he does, he shows up and he wants to talk about values. He wants to make a list of the important values for NetApp. It was like a 40 person company. It, it raised a lot of uh, Dilbert feelings <laughs> in people. In fact, I can tell you the, the first meeting where we proposed this idea to the engineers, and so the, the company as a whole was about 40 people, about 10 engineers. And I remember one woman stood up, her name was Florence, and she said, well, I just want to understand how will these values be used against us? Not, did not resonate at all. And, and so Dan, Dan was the new CEO. To his credit, uh, Dan shelved the idea and, uh, and decided to wait. It took him about two years to get back to it. And during that time, I learned some things about Dan's prior experience that explained a lot to me about why it was that he thought that values and culture were important in a company. So let me tell you the previous company that he had been the, the CEO of. He started as COO at a company called NET, Network Equipment Technology. And shortly after he arrived, he realized that a number of their large customers weren't paying their bills right. And it was kind of strange. It wasn't that they paid them late. It was some of them they would pay on time and others they wouldn't pay at all. And so one large company in particular, he collected up a bunch of purchase orders. He was the chief operating officer. Remember, he collected up a bunch of purchase orders, went out to visit the customer, and they're going through purchase orders. You paid this one, you paid this one, here's one, you didn't pay this one. The, the chief finance officer at that company looks down at the paperwork and says, that's not my signature. The sales guys at NET were forging purchase orders, sending customers equipment they hadn't ordered, and charging them for it. In some cases, they were actually buying warehouses and shipping equipment to the warehouses that nobody had ordered, but is showing them as going to fake customers. By the time the whole thing was, was unraveled, the CEO was fired. Dan was the replacement CEO. The VP of Worldwide Sales was fired. The chief finance officer was fired. There was an SEC lawsuit. Uh, one guy was actually indicted, but committed suicide the, the weekend before the indictment came in. The stock price went from 35 bucks to six. And I think what, what pissed Dan off the most about the whole thing was all of this was generating fake revenue that didn't exist that they hired on that basis. So they had to lay off a third of the people. So when Dan was saying he wanted to talk about company values, what he was really saying was, here's a list of behaviors that got me last place I was at. I don't want to live through that again. And I think the thing that, that bothered me so much about this talk of values in a corporate context was, I don't want my boss telling me what my values should be. Right, I mean, it, it smacked too much of like somebody telling me what my religion should be, or it's not your business. And so, so I, I kind of instinctively rebelled against that. But when I thought about it in the context of not, not my political values or my religious values, but, but in a corporate context, what are the things that are acceptable or not acceptable in that, context, in that uh, context, it seemed perfectly reasonable for the CEO of a company to be saying, here's the ground rules of how I want this business to operate. So the, the one, in the one way, it just felt wrong. In the other way, it felt perfectly reasonable. Like ground rule number one, how about no fake purchase orders to customers that don't exist? <laughs> and values are just, when you, when you have an value that says something like honesty and integrity, well, I mean, you could make a long list, no fake purchase orders, no, right? But honesty and integrity is kind of, so it took, us, it took him about two years to convince us to, to go down the path and, and make a list of stuff. So, so I, I kind of got over the problem of values about politics and religion. But the next place that I got to was we started making this list, and they just looked like the same values that everybody had. Oh, you should have honesty if there's a value and to, you know, work together, teamwork, that kind of stuff. And I started thinking about whether that made sense or not. And I made an analogy of, of values to a company are a lot like a constitution to a country. And so I was thinking, supposing you're starting a new country and you're writing the constitution and you're saying, well, should we have freedom of speech? Nah, that one's been taken. Other people already have that one. You know, we'll, we'll do some different ones. It makes sense to write them down. And there was, actually, there was actually one experience that I had that really brought home to me how values can be useful. And the experience was we were having a meeting about whether or not to lie to a customer. 
and which is not the best thing to describe, but, but there it is. We were competing for business at the NSA. You know, the guys who are recording this speech as we speak. You're, you're wasting your time. <laughs> we were competing at the NSA with a competitor of ours at the time named Auspex. And the NSA, there was a feature that the NSA wanted. It doesn't matter what it was. It was the Andrew file system. But um, neither of us had it. And they said, whoever promises it within a year, we'll buy from them. And we told them, we, we can't do it that fast. It's going to take us about 18 months. We, James and I, the other co-founder of NetApp, had both come from Auspex. We knew it was going to take them at least a couple of years. But they promised it within a year. So we were having this meeting saying, you know, if, if they buy from us, they'll get it in 18 months. If they buy from Auspex, it'll take them two years. So if we lie to them, it'll actually be good for them. Right? You know you're on the wrong path when you're trying to justify your lying to someone because it would be better for them. Because then they'll choose us. Not. So anyway, one of the employees in the meeting said, you know, we had this talk about values. We made a list. Don't lie to people is one of the things on the list. And here we have having this discussion. And you know, how, why does that make sense? So I'm not proud that I was in that meeting and that I'm not the guy who said this. But I'm, I am proud that that because we had this list and because we believed it, it shut down the discussion. And we told the NSA it would take us 18 months to deliver, and Auspex told them it would take a year, and Auspex won the deal, and we lost the deal. So it, it, values don't always get you to the right solution right away. But I do think if you look at the long run, it's like game theory. You know, when, the, when they look at game theory and say, what, how do you escape the prisoner's dilemma challenge of, like, it's always best to beat up the other guy, cooperation is never good. And the answer turns out to be, in one game, that's the case. But if you're planning on playing multiple games over a long period with the same players, game theory says that's the situation where cooperation works. And so that's, so I've gotten much more comfortable with talking about corporate values in the context of the behaviors that you would like people in the company. I'm still uncomfortable with telling uh, your employees what religion they should have or what political candidate they, you know, I think we probably employ employees who favored all 10, how many candidates were there? However many world religions there are. So let's see. So that brings me all the way back around to the management piece. Oh, and I'm, I'm doing good. You're going to have some time for Q&A. Um, that brings me all the way back around to the management piece. How did Dan convince me that it made good sense? One of the things he said, hey, I know you don't know anything about this. We'll, uh, we'll hire a coach. You can work with a coach. And, and I got some very interesting management tips from the coach. One of the managing tips I got from the coach, low level pragmatic, sometimes I would get stuck in these one-on-one -on -one meetings with people that just wouldn't end and they would keep talking and I want to escape the meeting and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. Anybody been in a meeting like that? <laughs> and so I explained this to the management coach and she said, that's easy, stand up. And I said, huh? She said, you stand up, they'll stand up. It's only natural. Then you walk towards the door, then they'll walk towards the door. It's only natural. <laughs> then you walk out the door, and there, the meeting's over. Uh, wow, what, what excellent, simple advice from a, from a management coach. Dan's advice, his observation was, you can try to manage a small group. You can try and tell a group of two people or five people what to do. Right? Every day, you try and figure out what, what they should do. You can't manage a group of 200 or 300 or 1,000 people that way, it's impossible because there's too many people to tell them all what to do. In fact, if you look at your staff, if you're managing uh, 500 people, your staff is maybe five or 10 people, and each of them have 50 or 100 people reporting to them. So his point was, if you want to manage people of that, si that size of a group, you have to try and explain where you want to get to. What's the vision? What's the picture? What are you trying to do? And, and communicate that to them. And his argument to me was that as a technology visionary, from a technology perspective, that's what I had been doing anyway, even though nobody reported to me. So I might be incompetent at being a first line manager, but he proposed that perhaps I could manage a larger group. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting leap. But, uh, but in fact, I think it was right. One of the other lessons I got as a manager, when I first started managing, um, I used a, a technique that I call management by whining, which is I would notice things I didn't like and, and bitch about them. 
And you know, you, everybody does that. You notice things you don't like and bitch about them. But here's what's interesting. When you have 250 or 500 people working for you, all of a sudden they run around and try and fix those things. You know, if they're good employees, I, holy shit. I mean, reaction number one, it's nice being the boss. And reaction number two, oh my god, I'd better whine as accurately as possible. <laughs> because if I don't whine pretty accurately, that people might do the wrong thing. I heard this story about George Lucas, that George Lucas was on Skywalker Ranch, you know, the, the, stu the Skywalker uh, production studios for special effects, and they're doing all this stuff, and he happens to see a, a, one of the buildings, and it's painted a light shade of brown, and he just kind of musingly says, well, I, I was thinking that might be painted a darker shade of brown. Just in passing, he walks by the next day, it's painted a darker shade of brown. And he said, oh my god, I was just observing. I thought it was going to be painted a darker. I didn't mean repaint it. What are you guys thinking? He walked by the next day, and it was painted a lighter shade again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to develop my management skills by whining as accurately as possible. And one day I had an epiphany, which is that whining is the evil twin of vision. And here's what I mean by that. Whining is describing as accurately can, as you can exactly how you wish the world was not. And vision is describing as accurately can, as you can exactly how you wish the world would become. It's the flip side. And that, that was a big breakthrough for me because what I, what I realized is that even though they're so similar, when you are working with groups of people, it's much more motivational to describe as best you can how you wish things would become than to just be bitching about stuff. Right? And, uh, but, the, but the takeaway is whenever you find yourself whining about something, that likely is an opportunity for vision. If you think of it, so you know, it's, because it's so easy to whine. I got some absolutely awesome lessons from Tom Mendoza. I mentioned him earlier about, uh, about management. Whenever I tried to deal with a management problem, given my engineering background, I would try and learn as much about the problem as I could. What exactly is going on? What are the different causes? How might it be fixed? What's the issue? Understand the details of it. That would be my approach to a, a problem that I had in my organization. Because if you're, if you're a boss of an organization, people bring you problems all the time. When I went to talk to Tom for advice, and Tom, I have to tell you, did not know anything about engineering. He could barely operate his wristwatch. I mean, this guy. He could sell anything, but, but not a technology guy. But I would still get a lot of good ideas from him. And he never explained what he did, but I reversed engineered his management algorithm. And here it is. His management algorithm was step number one, he would always start asking lots of questions about the people involved in the issue. Who's working on it? What are they good at? What are they doing? His real question was, does this problem have an owner? And if the problem doesn't have an owner, that might well be your problem right there. And you know, as a boss, you get to decide if you now want to be the owner of it. But the larger your organization, the less likely that that's the right answer. So step number one, does the problem have an owner? Step number two, do you trust the owner? And he meant trust in a very specific way. He didn't mean trust as in, I mean, Tom, I, I, I trust with my life. I and mean, I've worked with him for 15 years. I know him well. But if the issue is technology, I don't trust him at all. If the issue is to help me with a spreadsheet, I don't trust him at all. So trust, do you trust that, that they have the skill? Do you trust maybe they're busy? Do you trust that they have the time? Um, and so, so step number one, who's the owner? Step number two, do you trust them? And then if you can't get to a good answer on either of those, then step number three is find someone who can own the problem who you trust. I. I Notice something interesting. Tom, I said, has zero technology bones in his body, but he apparently knows about recursion. <laughs> because he once had a, a situation he was trying to deal with in the sales organization. He had a problem, and he identified that there was no owner and nobody that he trusted. And so he needed to find somebody who could do it. And so that was his new problem, which is, how do I find someone? So he, he figured out that he probably needed a headhunter. So he asked the question, who owns the problem of hiring a headhunter? And he identified that there was no owner, but he could assign it to HR. And so now the problem had an owner that he trusted to hire the, anyway, so he invented recursion, even though he's not at all technical. I, let me close with, with one last thing. 
I, I'm a, philosophically, I'm a pragmatist. I don't believe in like mystical magic stuff. I believe in cause and effect and physics and engineering. I mean, that's kind of my view of the world. And so it came as some surprise to me to discover that I believed in magic. And let me say what I mean by magic. When you look at teams of people, you can see small teams of people that seem to be working hard and get nothing done. And you can see other teams of people that also seem to be working hard, maybe goofing off sometimes, and it's astounding what they get done. Anybody here seen a research team or been part of a project like that? And you just, you don't know what happened. And I look at that and I go, okay, I believe in cause and effect. I don't believe in magic, but it's sure. And sometimes you see that around certain people. You know, that they create an energy, uh, management speak, right? Force fields of power that infect the brains of the people around. So that sounds like complete mumbo jumbo bullshit. And the longer I worked as a manager, the more I started to believe that kind of stuff. I felt guilty about it. And I finally figured out the solution as to why that made sense. And, and it was Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer, who helped me figure it out. Arthur C. Clarke has a saying, which is that any sufficiently advanced technology will seem like magic. He gave the analogy, if I took a flashlight to a primitive Pacific island and I'm flashing my flashlight around, all the natives on the island, wow, that looks like they don't know about batteries and Thomas Edison's light bulb and that stuff. So here's my point, the human brain is a sufficiently advanced technology. I mean, go over to the neuropsych guys and ask them what they really know. We're just cracking the surface. And if one human brain is just cracking the surface, a group of human brains working together is completely impenetrable at this point from any scientific or formal methodology. And I would argue as a result of that, perhaps for now, when you're managing teams of people, Magic is the most appropriate metaphor because it's sufficiently advanced that, that you should use. Um, I, there's a handout here for a book that I wrote. The, the book is kind of interesting to me, anyway. It's, uh, it's the story of NetApp, and I have an unusual position at NetApp because I've been there right from the beginning, from when we started, and I've been part of the leadership team for the 16 years since then. And usually, usually people on leadership teams get fired sooner. So you've got a set of people that see the very beginning and a set of people that see the, the wild hypergrowth doubling every year adolescence and a different set of people who see the, you know, turn it into a sort of major corporation, offices in 130 cities, sell the big customers, that, all that kind of stuff. I've seen the whole thing. And so I thought it put me in an interesting position to write about what it felt like through those. What's it like to be in a startup and how does it feel different to be as you start to get into that hypergrowth period, and then what's it like when you grow up and you know, have to do the other kind of stuff? One of the observations I had, I worked on a cattle ranch for a couple of years, and one of the observations I had was there were some lessons, not specifics, that felt very similar, but some of the feelings. And in particular, one of the feelings of being on a cattle ranch, small cattle ranch in the middle of nowhere, often there's some task to be done, and you don't know how to do it. But uh, surely in the world there's an expert in this task, but that expert does not work on your little cattle ranch in the middle of nowhere. And so this thing, whatever it is, you just do it yourself. And I think that attitude is so important in startups. I know it's important in small research teams of, of just whatever it is. And you know, maybe you find a book, maybe you, you learn up a little bit, but then you just dive in. And so in the spirit of that, I, I gave my book the title, How to Castrate a Bull. And in case you're wondering, there actually are instructions in the book. Uh, I put them towards the end, but for you, uh, I'll describe it. Step number one is it's best when castrating a bull to start when it's a calf. It's easiest for you, it's easiest for the bull. Uh, a calf is going to be probably 800 pounds, so don't be thinking that makes it easy. You immobilize it, you take your hand, you, you make a space like this, and you kind of whap up a bunch and then squeeze so the, the scrotum is there, and the testicles gotta be, and you don't want them to escape into the body of the bull, that would be bad. You take a dull pocket knife and cut off about the bottom third of the scrotum, and then you pull down. The testicles themselves are about the length of a cigar, but white, and, and with a strand back into the body. And then you take the pocket knife, and don't just cut, you wanna fray back and forth, because the more surface area you leave, the better it is for clotting. And then you, then you let the bull up, and 
And uh, surprisingly, this bothers them a lot less than being branded, just so you know. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> So you said you lost that um, deal to the other corporation that said they would promise to, do, uh, to give the technology in one year. Did that actually happen? <coughs> um, you are an awesome straight man. Let me tell you the end of that story. They did not deliver the technology in one year. They did not deliver the technology in two years. I found out later from someone who worked there, they never started the project to deliver the technology. It took the NSA about two months to, uh, I mean two years, to throw them out. And when they did, they became one of our large customers. And in fact, if you look over the past, the period since then, we've probably earned $100 million from the NSA. And to me, the lesson there is very interesting. When I look at values, Often the thing they encourage you not to do in the short run, it's painful not to do it. But in the long run, it's something you shouldn't be doing. I mean, and, and a lot of it, it all depends on what view you're taking. If your goal is to make a quick killing, to, to get in and get out, right, it, a lot of times values don't matter as much. If your goal is to keep living in the same neighborhood for the next 10 years, keep living, working with the same people for the next 10 years, maybe selling to the same people for the next 10 years. I think values are sort of a collected folk wisdom about ways that will do well for you in the long run. That, that's my personal view about, about value, what values are. And that's why I think if you're looking at, at the concept of creating a company over time, why, why that's such an important topic. Let me tell you another story. We, um, during the dot-com boom, there was this really interesting trick. It reminds me a lot of the financial stuff that's going on now. There was a really interesting trick that big companies did with small companies. So let's just pretend I'm a big company and you're a little startup. You come to me with this business proposal. You're a little startup with worthless stock, and you promise to sell some of your worthless stock to me for 100 bucks. And I'm a big company. I give you the 100 bucks, but only if you promise to immediately turn around and give me the 100 bucks back for equipment. That was a deal that a lot of people did. And you know, it's pretty tricky because I've got this money and I give it to you and you give it back to me, and it, but somehow it turned from money in my bank account to profit. Like, it's like magic, sort of like what the banks have been doing lately. And we had a lot of sales guys in the field who were all upset because they were competing against uh, other companies who were doing this trick. And they felt like they were losing these deals. And, and I think uh, when you think about this from a values perspective, which is what uh, Dan, our CEO, and Tom, our VP of sales, they looked at this deal and they said, wait a minute. If you're, if you're competing for a deal against some, from someone who has no money, that's not a real deal. And, and our VP of sales sent a message to all of the sales guys, and it was such a simple message. I like how he distilled things down to simplicity, but the message was, your job as salespeople is to find customers who have money <laughs> and take it from them. <laughs> as distinct from find customers who don't have money and give it to them and then take it back from them. And, and that actually, that, that kept us out of a lot of trouble. A lot of our customer uh, competitors did a lot of those deals and it turned out that when, it, when the end came and the tech crash happened, all of that was worthless stuff and it got written down. And anybody read the papers these days? I mean, we know how this story plays out, right? There's a difference between lying and maybe exaggerating your own competence about being able to come through under fire. Give an example of something when you actually did uh, stretch yourselves and bid for something that you really had to kill yourselves to do and how you did it. Um, you know, that's a really good point. And uh, you, you want to be, uh, be careful about the word lying. In fact, I probably wouldn't have been so blunt in describing aspects as lying in the way that I did if it weren't for the fact that they're out of business now which may be a side effect of that type of behavior, but it also means that you can no longer libel them <laughs> from a legal perspective. One of, the, one of the things that we promised to do was, uh, was to sell systems to Cisco. They wanted to have our storage systems in all of their sales offices around the world, or not all of them, but, but all of the large ones, and it turned out that that was about 60 countries. 
And at the time, we had people in maybe 20 countries. And so we signed up to accomplish this, not knowing completely how we would do it. Um, you know, we certainly had some ideas of who could we find to do it. And the way that we solved the problem in the end was that we signed up uh, IBM has a, a division of IBM called IBM Global Services, which is in the business of having people in every country in the world and doing this kind of stuff. And we signed up IBM to do this. And that actually turned out to be a good deal because they, as a result of doing that, they learned how to install and sell our stuff. And so they, they sold more of it. And eventually, over time, they became an OEM of our equipment. Um, but it is tricky. I mean, there's, it, it, there's a fine balance between promising you can do something versus never saying you can do anything if you don't already know how to do it. I mean, that, that's obviously not a good path either, and especially for a startup, because the whole business of a startup is trying to solve problems nobody knows how to solve, right? So the, I, I guess, so what's the lesson? When, when you're dealing with a customer, I think you should be fair with them about when are you, yes, we can just do this. And, and, and let them know that. And when are you in the zone of, we think we can do this, and we're going to work hard to do this, but we're, you'll be getting the, the alpha version. You'll be getting the first. I, I, I think that you can, you can be aggressive, but still honest, uh, is, my, is my belief. We had a case actually here at the university uh, about 10 years ago. There was a thing called the Provost Desktop Initiative, where they're going to buy about 1,500 computers for the uh, administrative staff. And, uh, uh, there were 20 some odd companies came by and at the end there were two companies left as finalists. We were one of them. The other company, uh, they wanted us to convert 1,500 machines, all different, to the new hardware uh, and do a software conversion. And, uh, and they wanted it done in two and a half months. So uh, the, we, we The checked. company that was going to sell to Princeton wanted Princeton to do this. Princeton wanted it done in okay. two and a half months. And uh, so we looked at that and we said, we just can't do it. We've got as good a staff as possible. It's going to take at least a year. Uh, the other company said, yeah, we'll do it in two and a half months. 14 months later, they still hadn't finished the job, and Princeton's IP staff had to finish it. Uh, as far as I know, they were never penalized for that. Princeton just rode through the thing. So sometimes it happens that way, too, I think. Um, would you choose them again? Yeah. No, I mean, the value stuff, it, so I chose a particular story where, in the long run, it turned out, you know, kind of the good way. But it doesn't always turn out that way. I, I think reputation lives with you for a long time. Um, I, I know a lot of situations where customers that we've got will say, boy, we, you know, and I, I won't say we've never screwed up. Uh, certainly we have, but it, it's something we, Th these, these types of things are things that the management team talks about, so the employees know that this is how we would like them to behave. We, we've had a lot of customers say, look, you still have to have the best product, and you have to you know, have good prices and all of that stuff. But it's just if it's kind of close, w we'd rather choose you than the other guy. And I, I think that that's an important margin. That doesn't mean if some guy comes out with a product half as much or, you, you know, it, 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 in the end, you still have to develop your new, that's why the engineering remains important despite all this other stuff. You have to develop innovative new problems that solve products that solve problems in new ways. But, but I do think that reputation and, and customers wanting to work with you matters a lot. But yes, I mean, it, 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 there are alternative strategies. <laughs> I won't deny that. So we decided not to lie, by the way. Lost the deal. So Congratulations. A so first you and then you. I was <clears throat> fascinated by your description of what uh, Napoleon Hill calls a mastermind team and uh, the magic of how teamwork happens. But you introduced that story by saying, you know, some teams really just don't get very far and others really fly. And as a manager, I'm curious if you have any clues as to how to make one tilt, tilt the um, um. odds in one favor. Boy, there's, there's so many things. I, I think openness and honesty are very important in that. And let me describe a technique that I have found works well as a manager when dealing with people raising complaints about the decision you've made or the path that you've chosen. Um, you often find yourself in a position as a leader of saying, we're going to, you know, we, we could choose path A or path Z, and we're going to take path A. 
and you send out some explanation as to why path A is the good path, almost inevitably, if it's an important decision, people will be coming into your office to explain to you why path A, the one that you chose, is a stupid path, and path Z, which you did not choose, is a better path. And I can't tell you how tempting it is to explain to them again why they're wrong. Surely they just didn't read your email explaining the subject clearly enough. You want to give them three more reasons why path A, in fact, is better and path Z. I can report from personal experience that does not work. Ironically, a technique that works really well is they come in and say path A is stupid, path that you chose, path Z is great. Tell them, you know, not only the reasons, three reasons that you said why path A is stupid, here's three more reasons why it might be problematic. And path Z, here's three reasons why that's a good path. It completely disarms them. What's going on? Why does that work? I think a lot of times when people are raising concerns to team leaders, I think we're on the wrong path. W one of the things they believe is that it might be the wrong path. The other thing that's going through their head is, I wonder if the boss knows. And if you can start by saying, here's three more problems with the path we chose, it, it allows them to say, wow, they, they really apparently thought it through. They, they really, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story. We, we had a major company decision at one point, eh, technical stuff. We were a NAS only company, a particular type of storage. And the technical question was, should we also do SAN, which is a different, it's kind of like Unix and Windows. You know, they were just competing and all the people on one side thought the other side was evil. And so anyway, we were making the decision, should we stick with just the one or should we do both? And uh, in the end, we made the decision to do both. And uh, now, nah, San, it sounds so stupid. I'll tell you, people quit over that. But how did we get people along? We actually staged a public debate after the decision was made. Everybody knew the decision was made. And we got a team of four of the people who had been vehemently against supporting this new technology, along with a team of people who were in favor, and allowed them to debate in front of about 200 people and literally debate the same arguments that they had used. And, and a, a lot of people would have just whitewashed it and said, oh, you know, everybody knows this is better. And all the people who felt strongly the other way would be like, no, everybody doesn't. I, I think that kind of uh, acceptance. So one more story. I, I always answer questions with stories. I was on an airplane with, uh, with a coworker from NetApp, and the flight attendant said, what would you like to drink? And Laura, the woman that I was with, wanted a sea breeze, which is cranberry and vodka, and I wanted Dr. Pepper. And she said to the flight attendant, cranberry, and I said Dr. Pepper, and she said vodka, and the flight attendant's eyes got wide and said, cranberry, Dr. Pepper, and vodka? <laughs> and Laura, who was a quick thinker, said, yes, one third of each. And I said, wow, make that two. And after we'd had like three more, it's kind of an interesting <laughs> drink. You know how a Long Island iced tea, maybe you don't all know this, but there's something magic about a Long Island iced tea where the way you mix up the ingredients, it doesn't actually taste like there's any alcohol in it, which makes it very dangerous. Um, the vodka, cranberry, and Dr. Pepper's like that because the cranberry's a bit sour and it cuts the, the, and the sweetness of the Dr. Pepper and together they hide the, anyway, so after three more each, we called it a Dr. Death. But, and I'm trying to spread that story so that you can order them at any bar. But here's the question, and this gets back to the heart of your team question. Who invented the Dr. Death? Because it, it might have been me and Laura, because that's what we ordered, except we didn't mean that when we said it. And it might be the flight attendant, because that's what she heard, except she was skeptical. Or it might be Laura, because she's the one who said, wow, that could be an order it. Or maybe it was me, right, because I ordered the second one ever. And I would argue that spending any time at all trying to figure out who invented that and who deserves the credit is very destructive to teams. And it's much better to think of the process of coming up with ideas as a group effort in which it's not my idea versus your idea, and if mine happens, I win, and if yours happens, you win. If you think of ideas as these more abstract things, that like the idea's on the other side of the table, and we're all on this, and we can kind of poke at it and test it, and maybe here's a problem, or maybe we can fix it, and in the end, 
you've got a great idea and you spend zero time on whose credit it is, but the team, I think teams that work like, I, I, there's gotta be a hundred answers, but for me, that's in the center of something important about teams that work well together. Let's take one more question. Hang on, two guys raised their hand at the same time, so those two are. We have, we're gonna have a reception after two, so if you have other questions, so, One, two. Actually, it's along the same, along the lines of the same question. One of the problems we have right now for, for small startup, I mean, two of us have come up with something, and right now we are choosing people to join us. Does that make sense? And we are in different institutions, different people are around us, we know different kinds of people, and we are, it's a huge dilemma. Um, which one of the people that we know is going to, you know, should join us, and how many people, you know, should we put both of them together or not? And that's along the same line because which one of us is going to manage and which one of us is going to, you know, we came up with that together. So which one of us is going to be convinced by that? That's a hard problem. I, I don't have an easy answer. When we came in, uh, James and I, who were the two, uh, the founder was named Mike Malcolm. He'd been a university professor, uh, but he'd also been the CEO of other startups. We knew he was the boss, and so we came in kind of with that understanding. Um, one technique that we used was we interviewed the hell out of people. I mean, it was scary. We, people would do 10 interviews, and then we'd call them in for eight more interviews. I mean, we, it was very much of a, it, some, of, some of the employees, complained about it that we interviewed, but on the other hand, we felt like we knew them pretty well and it let, them, let us do more of a, of a consensus building thing. Um, that's on the hiring piece. It, you do have to figure out, management is a bunch of things. I mean, part of management is knowing the right answer, but I would argue that another really important part of management is knowing the appropriate techniques for reaching right answers. <laughs> right, and, and, and those are very different issues. You don't have to always be the smart guy if you've got a process to sort of get people to, to get their ideas and run that. Managers who think I'm the smart guy so I'm in charge, I think don't tend to have as successful teams as managers who say, in the end there's gonna be disagreements and mostly I'd like to run a process to get to agreement if we can, and if we can't, I'll, I'll make the call. Um, but that, to me, that's a different discipline. It doesn't mean you're the smartest guy. It's a discipline of managing group dynamics. If you've got any folks who know that skill, that, that's great. Uh, if you don't, you might consider looking for some as opposed to promoting someone internal. One, One last question. So you, you had two CEOs both from outside the founding team, and they both worked out well. No, the first CEO, uh, Mike Malcolm, was in the founding okay. team. And, and we've only had one CEO since then, which is unusual. Dan worked out very well. So, so how did you find that person? How did you know that they were the right person? Um, the other two founders went to the board of directors and said, that guy's not the right CEO anymore. And it took the board of directors about a year, a year and a half to finally figure out that they agreed with us. And then the guy who was the chairman of the board, Don Valentine, who was also the chairman of the board of Cisco, told us the new guy was Dan, which we were perfectly happy for him to choose. In fact, when we signed him up as a venture capitalist, I went to talk with him, and my only message to him was, I heard from, through the grapevine that one of your goals is to replace the current CEO, and I just wanted to check that because I think that's the right thing to do. And his feedback to me was, yes, that's my plan. He said, one other thing that I thought was interesting, he said, hiring a new CEO is a lot like heart surgery, heart transplant surgery. He said, you find out very quickly whether it takes or if it's complete tissue rejection. And it, you know, what, it, there's, it, there's no, I don't think there's any such thing as a certain answer. You just gotta watch closely for the tissue rejection and if that happened, time for a new one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy the reception. <laughs>